it is. Oh, well done, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Royal Photographic Society and the latest in the series of awards talks with recent award recipients. It's my pleasure this evening to hand over to our awards manager, Joe McDonald, who introduced our two speakers this evening. So, Joe, over to you. Welcome to tonight's conversation between Kim and Hugh. Working and photographing soap bubbles and their associated phenomena has fascinated and enlightened Kim consistently. As a former printer, a fingerprint expert, she understands the necessary vigours associated, associated with such imagery. Kim was given the award for scientific imaging in 2021. Hugh Turvey is a pioneer of the X-ray art genre and has witnessed firsthand the advances of imaging. His work has cultural, art, historical and photographic reference points which bridge the, bridge the divide between art and science. Hugh was given an honorary fellowship of the society in 2014. The conversation will be followed by Q&A. Please put your questions in Zoom chat. The next conversation will be between Helen Van Neem, honorary, honorary fellow, and Martin Barnes on Wednesday, the 6th of July. Right. Is that us? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. this is us. So, good evening uh, to everybody. Um, as uh, Michael and Joe have done a sort of uh, the main introduction to this, I've just got an additional bit, which was uh, Kim has truly mastered the art of showcasing the iridescent beauty of bubbles since she began photographing in uh, photographing bubbles in 2009. Uh, she was finalist of the inaugural RPS Science Photographer of the Year in 2019 and again in 2020 and received the Scientific Imaging Award from the Society in 2021. Uh, the talk this evening is going to cover uh, a, a range of subject areas uh, from background to the journey of bubbles, what are bubbles and their uses, technical photographic capture, art and science crossover, um, her awards and proud moments, and what's for her next. So, Joe, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, tell us a bit about uh, your journey into bubbles, your background, um, how you came to, to be where you are, and a little bit of life abroad and family. Okay, so I lived in Baku in Azerbaijan with my husband and my kiddies. And when I was there, I set up digital photography classes for um, expats and nationals. So we'd run a course for six weeks covering basic aspects of photography, have an exhibition at the end of it. And I really enjoyed it. So I decided when we, we moved back to the UK, I wanted to teach because uh, GCSE and A-level photography were, had been introduced into the school curriculum. But obviously to, to teach, you need a degree and you need teacher training. So um, to get onto the degree course, I had to do AS level photography and a full-time student on a BTEC national certificate. So it was when I was doing the AS back in 2009, that one of the units, um, we had to be quite creative and encompass Photoshop, which was pretty new to me. So I thought I'd just take some photos of the bubbles and put memorable you know, objects that mean a lot to me inside the bubble using Photoshop. Yeah. And that's when I took my first photos and they were absolutely rubbish, dire, dreadful. So what year was that? 2009. Right, do you think you've improved? Yeah, I, I think so, <laughs> because photographing wasn't as easy as I thought. And then you start researching because they kept on bursting and, and other techniques that I'd never used before. And I'd obviously, I've done wildlife photography, weddings, portraits, all sorts of stuff. And as a fingerprint expert, you know, quite a bit of them. But bubbles, they were in another league of their own. Yeah. <laughs> <the little> so, 
the um you you did you come to education later then after having been abroad uh with family uh, oh. e even though you were teaching out there to expats yeah, because i couldn't teach in this uh, in this country without having qualifications teaching qualifications because when i did my fingerprint experts course that's five years that's sort of like equivalent of a phd so never in a million years did i think i'll be going back and and doing more studying to do yes. a job that i absolutely loved and i wanted more than just setting up say evening classes or something like that i thought i love working with teenagers absolutely love them and I thought, well, A-level photography, GCSE, fantastic. Yes. No, I think teaching is a, a fabulous thing. Yeah. Um, and you also, um, there's a connection with you in the South Coast. You live in the South Coast. And yeah. In fact, when we um, met up prior to this, just for a quicker introduction um, in, we well, say this place wrong, Odiham, Odiham. Odeon. Hook, Hook Odeon uh, in Hampshire. Yeah, Hampshire. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, you, you'd driven up from Poole, I'd driven down from North London, we met Middle Way, um, but what's your connection with the South Coast? Um, well, I was brought up in Wokingham in Berkshire, and my husband, Neil, he was in the Marines, left the Marines, um, and had moved to Poole, and of course I was going down from Wokingham to Poole to meet him, and when we got married, said move to Poole. If I don't like it after about a year, we can live anywhere I like. Yes, uh, and that's, that's where it was. I didn't want to leave my friends and still working. I quite liked it there. But you, once you move down and you give it a go, it's like, why would I want to live anywhere else? It's well, I was, I was intrigued to know or learn that you had connections with Robert White. And I think there's quite an ongoing uh, relationship there with uh, a group of people that also aided maybe your interest or? Yeah, I, I got on the, to the BA Honours Photography degree course at the Arch University in Bournemouth. And someone recommended Paul Williams for print and photographs for me. And he had the lab next to Robert White, a photographic dealership. And that's when Robert was alive. Yeah. So I got pretty much all my photos printed at Paul's and I've always got equipment at Robert, unless of course they don't sell something then get it elsewhere so and then when I finished my degree obviously I tried to encompass bubbles into art symbolism throughout the whole of the degree course uh, and I, I just got hooked with the art and the science of them so I was photographing bubbles pretty much all the time yes people would come up with you know, uh, and you're currently in a studio that that you now dedicated yeah. to bubbles which is in, yeah. in and around that area this is this is my own studio now. We moved in here last September in Wimborne. Yes, fabulous. It looks fabulous. It's nice having the space. It's not so nice being on my own. I miss Paul and Stu because I ended up renting desk space with Paul and, and Stu Cully. So the three of us, we you could talk about photography. You just had a great time. Yeah, I, so, I, I have a connection with uh, Robert White and because I was asked to do a memorial piece to him uh, following his untimely death, uh, which uh, it now sits within one of the facilities that he donated a huge amount of money to the NHS, yeah. uh, can cancer treatment. Um, so I, I've always had a bit of a soft spot and uh, I know that having access to uh, the facilities uh, and that type of connection must have been very useful for you, um, just with a sort of understanding early part of your career. Yeah, because I think with the equipment and the, the guys at Robert White, when I was getting equipment there, they're very good at explaining and if I wanted to borrow anything. And Paul, printing. Printing is a mastercraft. Mm. Oh, fabulous. So, yeah, I was, I've been very lucky. Yes. Uh, and I was also interested to see that you, you tried to get into Berkshire College of Art and Design, which is where I also went. Uh, yeah. but, sad, but sadly, <laughs> sadly didn't get on the course. <laughs> yeah. oh, I was, man, I was a school photographer when I was sort of like 15. Um, my chemistry teacher set up a little dark room in a store cupboard and I took photos of cross country, rugby matches, sports events. However, when I applied to do uh, the Berkshire College of Art in Design, instead of doing a portfolio of photos I'd taken for school, I thought I'd, I'd do a portfolio of photos that I was being creative, you know, with this Coke in Star 16 filter and the different yes. 
They were appalling. I've still got the portfolio. Yeah, so, but I didn't get in the first year I applied and I didn't get in the second year. No, but <laughs> I think you, from, from reading and, and obviously meeting you uh, for our sort of preliminary chat, you've got this huge wealth of knowledge from uh, loads of different areas of photography. Uh, and that's possibly a, a fabulous foundation for the next part of our chat, sort of the bubble journey and the point of recognition. Yeah. So, I'm going to look uh, at the crib sheet. <laughs> yes, you've got a crib sheet. We're sharing a crib sheet. <laughs> so we're both on the same page. Yeah, literally, yes, literally. page three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, tell us uh, about, I, I've got, uh, a few things listed. I've got inspiration, an OXO exhibition, which I don't know anything about, which I'm interested to know about. Uh, yeah. Science Photo Library, which I obviously supply imagery to, as do yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have something in common there. Trinity College, I think, is a, a really interesting part of the story. And then Eurofoam, which doesn't sound very exciting, but I think it is. So Eurofoam, Eurofoam 2014. So, yeah. so in inspiration, I think we've covered some of the um, uh, moments that you've had within education but what is it about bubbles in particular? I think when I started photographing the bubbles for the AS and then the the, the BTEC the national certificate and the degree the more you research the more you find out about them and of course these are a subject that everybody knows about we all shall we all do washing up they just seem such ordinary everyday objects but when you find out about photographing and how you can photographing, and especially the science and how important they are for science and science research across squillions of different genres, then it starts getting your brain ticking. Did the, did the science come to you when you started collaborating? So the, the Trinity College or the Eurofame, is it at that point the science became more interesting or relevant? Well, no, because I'd always, I always found the science side really interesting. In fact, one of my university, the degree lecturers said, you do realise this is an arts university, not a science university, because they just feed off each other, the, pho the photography, the science. Um, and during the final year of the degree for the professional practice, I had to send portfolios and make contact with um, industry experts. Yeah. So during the degree course, when I was researching papers on bubbles and soap films and phones. This guy, Stefan Hustler, his name kept on cropping up. So I found out that he was at the School of Physics in Trinity College in Dublin. And I just I just sent him a portfolio. Yeah. Hope that he'd say, thanks for the pictures. They're very nice. Good luck with your degree. Then I could write that into my notebook and submit it with my end of year professional practice unit. Yes. Did did it go further? He said, yeah, they're amazing. <laughs> Well, amazing flattery absolutely I've, yeah what I've, a great compliment so so what happened past that point well it from me graduating and going over to dublin in the august he'd contact Theodoris Carapantios, the professor who was in charge of organizing EU Foam 2014. They were having the conference there and the EU Foam conference is where all researchers from all, all areas of science that have an interest in, in foams and bubbles gather once every two years. They present papers and posters and we have a great time. Anyway, so the, this um, EU phone conference was in Thessaloniki in Greece. Thodoris was arranging it and they wanted to have my photos on a loop on the television and could they use my photos for the front cover of their book of abstracts. Yeah. Which we went, yeah, absolutely. I wasn't expecting that either. No, amazing. And then of course it was when I went to Trinity to meet Stefan for the first time in Dublin in August. And he explained to me his area of research. And when you're working, when you can talk to someone who knows what they're doing and, and what bubbles can do, and you're actually seeing what they can do in, in the lab there, it's like, oh, huh, I love them even more than I did before. So, so for, for me, uh, when I'm x-raying, uh, I obviously have access to all sorts of different equipment. Yeah. And uh, seeing how technology is used across the board in all these different uh, testing facilities um, or, or um, labs etc I just find it absolutely amazing um, and has 
opened my eyes certainly to the science of of the art of what I do. And I think that's something that that is the same for you, uh, where you, by having access and being around people, it just opens up other opportunities. And also um, for me, has helped me perfect the technique certainly over the years. So you're looking for more and you've got a bit more push from the, uh, the scientists to explore a little bit further push yourself a little bit further and I find that <laughs> fabulous but also if you if you know because when we met last week you said that you spend a great deal of your time actually looking or looking at stuff but in imagining what it's like inside yes well, they're, they're, I think we we found a difference between us at that point where uh, you, you've very much been looking at a surface uh, and you're obsessed with surfaces of bubbles and they are just a surface really around air uh, whereas I'm very much focused on a, an internal space and how mm -hmm. things are put together and start imagining the world around me in that way so I can quite easily you, you start imagining the world where it's bubble related uh, yeah, and, is, um, because Bobo's sort of like a base set of plateau uh, of laws plateau's laws quite a lot of the configurations that they make can actually be found in nature as well so mm -hmm got the link if nature can do something and bubbles can do the same then you know it's sort of like optimal yes fantastic but i have to say stefan and his his students stefan's amazing and explaining really techie stuff yeah i've been to the eu foam conferences everyone presents uh abstracts in the book of abstracts or posters and they start their presentations into their research for their conclusion and you, know, you can understand the first couple of paragraphs anyone can understand that on the whole and then they get into their techie stuff yeah <laughs> <laughs> and you you just you just have to sit there in in the halls and think how can how can these people be so clever yes I, 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 I went, to a, get it from? I, went, I went to a conference recently. Uh, I was invited to a, um, a sort of brainstorming session uh, for uh, uh, Algae UK. And they were talking about every type of algae application for the future. And again, I think I understood, I understood the small bits at the beginning, the, the easy digestible piece of uh, science uh, yeah. or, or thought or process. And then past that point, how you extrapolate uh, proteins from cells. You know, it's, it's uh, just a bit beyond me at the moment, but it's not to say that I'm really interested in it. And I think it's that curiosity that will drive me into trying to yeah. work with them, to collaborate with them. And uh, I think it is a learning process. And I think science is that sharing of knowledge anyway. So, uh, that's, oh, one of the nice things about collaborating with Stefan, because he's um, actually the leader of the Foams and Complex Systems Group at the, the School of Physics at Trinity, yeah. is because he's very, very good at explaining, then I want to learn more because he's good at explaining and showing in, in simple terms. It's fantastic. Love it. <laughs> yes. So, um, right. Back. So, Shall I, shall I talk to Michael and ask if he can put some pictures up now? Yes, yeah, so, so we've, we've moved on to uh, what are bubbles and uses. Okay, so when you're, when you're looking at bubbles, um, there's three areas that, that I look into. The first one is the colours that they make. Everyone knows that soap bubbles, you've got colours. Um, but you might not realise a little bit of the science about it, but why they're important. So, Michael, please, could we have the next picture? Sure. OK, so if you look at bubbles, what you see here is um, the light iridescence. So light comes in, white light comes in, hits the bubble, the surface, the bubble wall, and it's the light's diffracted into component parts. Now, depending on how thick the bubble is, how thick the wall is, depends on what color you see. So, and you only get certain colors at certain thicknesses. So if you imagine a bubble, obviously made of liquid, the liquid drains because of gravity, 
but it doesn't drain uniformly. It swirls and moves around because of at the atmosphere and atmospheric conditions around it. So hence you get the patterns. Okay, picture number three, please. Okay, so if you go in a little bit closer, you can see here you've got the bubbles, you can see some of um, the iridescence and, and the colours a little bit closer up, but then also with my sort of photography and the stuff that I really like is going even closer, and that's picture number four, please. Yeah, so, so this photo actually won the, at the British Photography Awards in 2020 um, in the macro category. And you can see the colours going even further. Uh, how, can, how close are we? Uh, on my Zeiss 100mm lens with bellows, yeah. probably about an inch and a half. Right, and what sort of magnification are we looking at? Oh, loads. I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> Off the top of my head, I have no idea. But the problem is with, with the Zeiss lens is if any of the bubbles burst, the lens gets sprayed. because of Yes. The, so you have to clean it and then you have to move it and then you have to start focus again. That can be tricky. But I now have, um, well, I've had for a couple of years, a Rodenstock 105 float. Right. That <laughs> sounds very exciting. It goes through ratios one to one, one to two, one to three, one to four, and then reverse. But the minimum focus in disc is nine centimeters. Wow. So I can get huge magnifications with a nine centimeter gap. So loads of light can come in. And if bubble bursts, it's not so bad. It's an amazing lens. Yes. There's definitely a working, um, I don't know, experience where you're trying out the different equipment to, to work out what, what the best is. Well, I'm, very lucky. Scenario. I'm lucky because Paula Pell Johnson from Linhoff Studio, she lent me that lens for a month in oh, December, wow. a month and a Hasselblad camera to go with it to try them. Yes. Yeah. So she's a goddess. Thank well, you. she'll be giving it to you now that you've just given her a great credit. I, I already bought it. But, but yeah, it's because people are working. People like Paul and the guy at Robert, Jack at Robert White, are quite happy to lend me some equipment and Stu and Paul that you have to give it a go. I'd never go and buy a piece of equipment off the shelf and hope that it would be okay. Because in sure. most, like most of the time, it's not okay. No. Yeah. Okay, Michael, photo number five, please. And then that's really, really close. So you see, and you're, you're talking about just a couple of millimetres. Now, when you see all the colours on the bubbles, there comes a point because the, the cycle, the, the colours go through a cycle and they go through a cycle in order. So if you see a rainbow, the colours always appear and then a rainbow. Rainbow colours are not the same as soap bubble colours because a rainbow is obviously water vapour and a soap bubble is obviously liquid. But if you could protect the bubble without the atmospheric conditions interfering with how the liquids flow, then you would see the cycle. Now, there comes a point, obviously, because the bubble made of liquid, the liquid drains and the big cup bubble becomes really, really thin, the bubble wool, and you know it's about to burst. But before it bursts, the wool becomes so thin that light interference, the iridescent can't take place. And it's all you see is very, very dark gray and black spots. So Michael, that's picture number six, please. Hello? Michael, can you hear me? Yeah. So you see, if you, that's what a bubble wall will look like, literally milli, milli, milliseconds before it bursts, no colors whatsoever. So what I'd like to do now is show a video, and this video shows the light interference cycle. Now, there's more on these later, but what you're going to be looking at is a glass cylinder with equally sized bubbles inside it. So the bubbles are protected by the cylinder. So the bubbles have just been made, and when a bubble has, has just been created, the walls are too thick to see any colours. But as they're draining, the, the colours begin to appear. So 
I've just edited this this video just last week and it's the first video I've ever edited so please make allowances for that the actual video is 28 minutes long but I've condensed it down I've chopped <laughs> it out but you'll get the gist but just watch it carefully because the colors are amazing okay Okay, so you can see a little movement. That's the liquid draining down through all the bubbles. So there's liquid coming in at the top? No, all, all the bubbles are made of liquid and they're sitting on top of each other confined in this tube. Mm -hmm. So you can just about to start see colours now. If you're wondering what the shadows are, the grey semicircles, that's because the light is held at an angle so you can see the colours. So you either have a little bit of shadow and the colours lit up, but as time goes, the, the shadows fade. So you can just see now the colours are, are coming through. Can you, can you see the greens and the pinks? Yeah, fabulous. And the way the liquid sort of like drains away, you think that some of the liquid is going up. Now, that's not always the case. It's very deceptive. So the liquid's actually draining down towards the bottom of... Yeah. yeah. The, tube, the tube is upright in a retort stand. Yeah. Filled with bubbles and all the liquid drains down to the bottom. So the bubbles that are at the bottom of the screen because of all the liquid they're made of it is draining down, it sort of like keeps the bubbles at the bottom. Their bubble wall's quite thick because the liquid's all draining through their, their bubble channels. The wall. Sure. Is this in real time as well? This is in real time, yeah. You will see in a minute when I've clipped through for the next bit. That they look like sort of surreal landscapes at this point. Yeah, yeah. Of course, to see any of the bubble colours, you have to use directional light. You have to photograph them against a black background, use directional light. Is it a specific light or just any light source? Any light, any white light. Yeah. But there's more of these structures a bit later on. It's starting to look like a Dr. Zeus landscape, I think. <laughs> Thing one and thing two. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the who. Okay. Right, I might suggest that we stop the video here completely because uh, you've just, this will just carry on draining. Um, eventually the yellow colour, which is one of the last or the last colour to be seen, that disappears completely. And then all the bubbles go from being pale grey to dark grey and sort of like display patterns that you saw in the photo previously. So, Michael, if we can have uh, photo number eight, please. You missed the finale, ta-da. Yeah, ta-da. <laughs> Right, so if I was to take, this is made up of lots and lots and lots of photographs where I've photographed the bubbles in the tubes and done them in the actual light interference cycle. So the top left, there's three rows and you view them from left to right, then the middle row left to right, the bottom row left to right. So you can actually see all of the colors that a bubble will go through during, during its existence. And, and why why do why do them in a tube? Um, because that's the work that Stefan and his his students were, or some of his students were studying when I very first went over. It was all about the science of packing and how bubbles will shuffle and shift and organize themselves in confined spaces. In this case, we use different sized bucket bubbles, all of them equal in size, in tubes of different diameters. Mm -hmm. Again, more of this in the next bit. And so, yes, uh, so uh, I've got written on uh, one of my little notes, uh, plateau borders. Do you want to talk about those? 
Yeah, can we do? Can I do the pattern borders when we come to the structure bit? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, right. So then, so that's the first part of the bubbles that interest me. The colours. How do you get the colours, um, and the sequence? What can you do to prolong the colours? Uh, that the next section, which is, uh, please, can we have picture number nine? Okay, so the next area of interest is flow. So bubbles obviously made of liquid. And if you get lots of bubbles together, then that's a lot of liquid and it's got to flow somewhere. It's got to, to drain away. So if you see, I've made a soap film and blown some bubbles at the top of the film. And can you see all the liquid that's draining around the bubble wall and then going into the soap film at the bottom? because mm -hmm. this is sort of like things you don't really think of well you understand that they do that but it's not really in your consciousness is it it's like oh yeah of course the bubble the liquid's got to go somewhere duh <laughs> yeah okay and then please can we have picture number 10 so again can you see how the liquid's flowing the areas where it's going from if you see the bubble walls the lines you see some of them are turquoise in colour? Yeah. Again, with the, the light going through the bubble, uh, the same thing happens with uh, the bubble walls, these lines. So you only get certain colours at certain thicknesses. So it sort of like shows that the thickness throughout the bubble is the walls aren't the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then number 11, please, Michael. And then this is really, really, really close up. And so what, what is this? This is a tiny weeny bubble in between three bubbles. So you've got three bubbles and then a really small one in the middle. So obviously, because you can't autofocus a lens on any of the bubbles, even with the colors, you have to focus manually. And the lens, the camera, picks up parts of the bubbles that you don't always see with the human eye. Mm -hmm. But if they were big enough to see, you, you, you can't comprehend them. So that, that's something I hadn't thought about, which is the, uh, the focusing of this. Uh, are you manually focusing as it's yeah, uh, cr creating and forming in front of you? Uh, yeah. And you're, you're tracking it live and you're trying to get yeah. that key moment. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, don't forget, liquid's always moving. Mm -hmm. It was never stationary, so then you still have the, it's just as tricky as someone photographing a motorbike going around yep. you know, a circuit or you know, an Olympic sprint, sprinter. I thought, I thought uh, you, you've part started describing this image to me before, and I was quite interested uh, about the correlation with the flow of liquid in it, because mm -hmm. again, it's something I didn't really know anything about, uh, that the you have the film on the outside, is that correct? Yeah. The, the outside skin, effectively. Uh, but you have these cavities within. Uh, yeah. Tell me what that is again. Right. Well, the, well, the easiest way I can explain it, if you have a handful of paint emulsion and you threw it against a glass window, the emulsion when it's in the tub is pretty much the, the same texture, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The emulsion that touches the glass is going to move slowly, slowly down the glass because of drag. The emulsion that you can actually see that's on the outside is because it's exposed to air, it's going to start going hard. It's going mm -hmm. to start, because emulsion does that. This is with this bubble picture, it's like looking inside that blob of emulsion to the stuff that you can't see. And I thought what was interesting is, sorry, uh, I thought what was interesting is when the, the water drains naturally with gravity, down through the structure of bubbles, that it's using these conduits between the bubbles. Yeah, the plateau to, to, borders. To, say again? The plateau borders. Yes, so the plateau borders. Yeah. Can we talk about plateau borders now? <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about plateau borders when we come to structure. Yeah, sorry, Bob. <laughs> plateau borders after the 18th century Belgian physicist Joseph Plateau, yeah. I'll mention very quickly, bubbles very important because they obey Plato, Plato's laws. And it's a set of rules that uh, Joseph Plato 
um, came up with that explains how bubbles behave, how they react, what they do. And it's always, okay. and they're always constant. Thank you. Okay, so Michael, please, can we have the next photo, number 12, please? Right, and then you have a big bubble with two tiny, tiny bubbles inside it. So you see all the bands of color? Mm -hmm. There, this is the bubble showing laminar flow. So laminar flow of a liquid, say water, is when the liquid will come out, say the, you know, the fountain in the Burj Al Arab in Dubai, in the foyer, they've got the world's massive fountain. <laughs> and the fountains make amazing patterns. Now, ordinarily, if it was water out of a tap, those fountains, when the water hits, is gonna make a horrendous amount of noise in such a big atrium. As the, the, the tubes that the water come out, they, they're designed that the water comes out as a laminar flow. That means in perfectly even layers. So it doesn't make noise, it's quiet. Mm. Laminar flow is quiet. So when water comes out of a tap, it, it swirls, gets mixed with air, but the laminar flow, everything's nice and smooth and everything goes along lovely. But of course, each, each color indicates a different layer of the bubbles that's, that's moving. And I'm sure you can, I don't know how many layers are there, but I'm pretty sure you could probably count a whole load more. And capture for something like this, are you, spending mm. hours and hours trying to get the perfect thing or is this just floated in front of you and you thought that's it no these were actually quite easy to take mm -hmm. it's a, a bubble hanging with two little bubbles that are at the bottom of the bubble that's hanging so they're not moving right in my world relatively simple yes well <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay so now we'll go on to structure okay all right so every everybody you can imagine what bubbles are like so here you've got the background the black bubbles are a layer of bubbles on a liquid and then another handful of bubbles on top of that and then photographed so what bubbles want to do always they want to achieve an equilibrium a whole collection of bubbles together all wants to even out, all become the same size and all form a flat layer. So what the bubbles do to achieve this, meanwhile, at the same time, some bubbles are bursting because that's what they do, but bubbles will always uh, try to fill the gap. But bubbles will take air from adjacent bubbles. So please may we have uh, the next photo, number 14. Right, so here you've got one layer of bubbles. If you look at them, they look like a whole load of funny shape, not, well, polygons, aren't they? So if you see a straight line between separating two bubbles, that means the air pressure either side of that line is equal. If a line is curved, it means one bubble is taking air from an adjacent one. So they're all trying to take air, lose air, all become equal in size, and everything's perfect in the bubble world. I mean, obviously that rarely happens, but that's what they try to do. They try that... to make the best use of space that they inhabit using the least amount of, of energy. And I, I thought that was quite interesting that the application of that uh, method or that uh, part of nature to do that at equilibrium uh, mm. was quite intriguing. So that, that was the sort of application, the use. Um, did you want to talk about that? Yeah, so if you might think, well, why is everybody researching and finding about bubbles? Why are they so important when all of us just assume that bubbles are, are, are good for washing up and for a liquid. But in the manufacturing process, if you have a liquid and you're going to manufacture something, say plastic, do you want a hard plastic or a flexible plastic? When you look at their molecular structure, they will have some sort of uniformity, won't they? So if you can 
use bubbles and try and recreate structures to find what's going to be quite strong, what's going to be quite flexible, then you can work that out for whichever manufacturing process that you intend to do. So glass, if you take glass in, a, in an ordinary window and then bulletproof glass, their molecular structures are very, very different. So again, when you look at them and because of bubbles relationships with minimal surfaces, then that information goes on. You can hardly, hardly practice with molten glass. Yeah, so, so that's with um, material sciences and the science of packing, but then also if you think around the planet, any ma manufacturing process that produces a liquid frothy foamy as a waste byproduct, foams uh, are yep. a real big problem as a byproduct. Hmm. So we need to understand about their stability, how they can be broken down, how they can be got rid of ASAP with the least amount of fuff and faffiness, which is, you know, some of the guys at, at the EU foam conferences, that's their area of expertise. But then foams also absorb. So if you have an oil spill or you drop wine on the carpet and you get the, you know, the little spray out, and it says in capital letters on the instructions, shake, spray on the, the wine stain, do not rub. It means do not rub, don't touch it. Because if you spray the foam onto the wine stain, like an oil spill, and you, you, you cover that with foams, which are used, the foam draws up the oil, the oil from the surface of the sea. So, so, so when you started your bubble, um... I don't know, career, did you imagine that you'd be talking about this sort of application of bubbles at this point? No, 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 no. I mean, um, this, is, this is the fascinating thing about it, is that it's, the... It is, because, but also by, if you, by going through the conferences, because obviously bubble research is very important for mathematics as well. So oh, it, it's just the biggest world of wonder. I think. <laughs> yeah, anyway, okay, yes. Mike, can we have number 15, please? Okay, bubbles again. Can you see how they're all sort of like beginning to settle themselves down? Some are looking as if they're about the same size. Mm -hmm. So this comes down to foam stability and how long a foam will last. So if you think of uh, fairy liquid, washing powder, toothpaste, shaving foam shower gel all of those produce foams they're all bubbles aren't they so if you use fairy liquid to wash up the bubbles must clean greasy dishes also when you tip the water away it's it's got a you can't have bubbles lasting for you know a week if you think of um toothpaste comes out of a tube you add water and the action of scrubbing produces even more bubbles and that's got to do that job and then if you think of shaving foam, no one wants their toothpaste to have the same um, sort of like capabilities and behave the same way as shaving foam. Can you imagine going mm. to your teeth? <clears throat> and the same with shower gel and shampoo. When you've had the shower and you come out, you want to you know, look at the bottom of the shower and know that most of the bubbles have actually disappeared. You don't want to go into the shower the next morning and find it's, you know, there's still two inches of bubbles in there. So do you, do you find yourself just creeping around everywhere, trying to find bubbles? And well, I don't mean creeping, that may be a bit so slightly <laughs> odd, but do you find yourself obsessed uh, with bubbles? And you're seeing bubbles everywhere. So you're seeing them in the shower and you're seeing them when you brush your teeth. And Yeah, because you just think, that's really clever. That's clever that someone does a shower gel and all the bubbles get washed away by the time I've come out. And is that then driving you to try and visualize those in some way, to explore the mechanism of those bubbles? No, because the whole idea of me photographing the bubbles is I want them to last as long as they possibly can without break bursting, because that makes my job a lot easier. Yeah. Well, um, I, I'm sure you got, there are more slides, I think, in this series. Yes. So if and we look I, at the last, I, the last slide, number 16. And I, and I was going to give you a time check as well. Wow, how long have we got? Two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Hugh, can I suggest that you just play each photo from there on? 
for about three seconds and I will very quickly in three seconds say what it is. Is that an idea? See, this Sorry. is OK, Michael. That sounds good. good. Yep. Can't stop talking. <laughs> Tell us about this one, Kim. OK. Right. So um, this is obviously equally sized, but it is my favourite, favourite photo my grey one, and it was uh, the British Institute of Professional Photographers. They did an article on me, and it was my very first front cover. I Fabulous. And I why, the, the, why the small little bubble in the middle? Or a couple of small little bubbles? Interest. Nice. Carry on. Yeah, OK. Sorry. Bye through all the others. So this is this is the setup that they had in Dublin for creating the ordered cylindrical structures where you you've got an aquarium pump pumps equally sized bottle bubbles into the glass cylinder tube. Okay, next one. And that's what they look like. Stunning architectural imagery. Yeah, okay, this Kelvin cells um, occasionally they are Another cave at Kelvin cells, Goldberg zero, Goldberg zero. So there's, there's quite a lot of structures. We call them regular structures because they, they uh, create equal patterns. Okay. And that is the equivalent of the bubble that's just about to burst. You remember what, early on when we had the gray and black bubble, that's what- So, the so this has lost all its liquid. Or about to lose. Yeah, and, and this this is a week or so after I created them. Oh wow! Can you see all the lines? Hmm? When the liquid drains, the bubbles crystallize. So instead of being round and plump edges, they they have straight edges. You see all the lines. They're the extrusion lines on the tube during the manufacturing process. Ever. So Ever. you could you could use bubbles to highlight imperfection. Yeah, and then you obviously have the flying Fubini that was named by uh, Dennis Weir. Thank you. Um, the nose, it looks like little faces. The eyes are part of the drainage. The nose and the mouth, um, the moustache is, is actually because I forgot to cover up a little bit of the retort stand clip that you you tighten. Yeah. Lamp with. And that's the shadow. Ah. But we like it. Okay. Next. Yep. So this is this is part of um, the British Institute of Professional Photography, but it, again, it, it's the bubble chains and the ordered cylindrical structures. Okay. Next one. Uh, bubble chains. Yeah. So <laughs> Stefan looked at um, his research was into equally sized bubbles in glass tubes. I was at. Uh, in my studio photographing the bubbles in the tubes and I put a funnel in the top to stop the bubbles coming out because there's a constant supply from um, the aquarium pump and I just thought what happens if I replace the glass tube with a length of plastic and put bubbles up there what will they do when they come out and they started to make uh, the same sort of structures that we were creating in the glass tube. But, but self-ordering themselves as they... Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so I think we should maybe skip all the rest and go to the video. If we've got time for that, What's the, how long have we got left? No, carry on, Kim. I think we're all fascinated. Oh, yay! Okay, so you, <laughs> see, so you see this tube. You see the little lines coming out. They're, they're tiny, tiny bubbles. If you look at some of the other tubes where the lines are so they're separated, they're bigger bubbles. So this coming up to the EU foam conference in, in 2016 in Dublin. And I knew Stefan would be really excited because I didn't tell anyone about it. I, I discovered these regular bubble chains and he came over to go over the last few things for the EU foam conference. And I said, I got something to show you. Watch this. And he couldn't believe it. I've never seen anyone so excited. It's like, oh my God. So 
We've, uh, we presented our poster with Dr. Jens Winkerman, as he is now, at the EU Firm in Liege at the conference in Belgium in 2018. And we're going to have a chapter in Michelle Emma's book uh, that's coming out in September. It's just amazing. So, Ooh. yeah, because for all photographers, we're in the business of seeing, aren't we? Yeah, certainly. In order to take good photographs of bubbles, you need to put the camera away and just watch them for ages and see what they do. So this one is Calvin cells. Can you see a little square? In, in the centre. Yeah. And you can see there's a big gap with the tube. So different size bubbles create different size patterns to some extent. Not always, but it's not an exact science making them do this. Mm. But it's not an exact science making them in the tube either. <laughs> can I ask you, a... Sorry, can I ask you a sneaky question, Kim? Um, what, yeah. what what liquids are we looking at on some? Is it is, is it water or is it some? Is it a glycerin or is it some other liquid? It's water and fairy liquid. Ah, okay. And you can add glycerine, absolutely. Mm. You add any surfactant to make the bubbles last longer. Honey, you can use honey. Mm. And if you look on the web, there's millions of recipes. Don't put anything in the dishwasher, though, if you're using surfactants. <laughs> You'll never get rid of the bubbles. Should we play this uh, video? Yes. So, so this is what, and this is slowed down. You see what they do? It's fantastic. We love it. Why did you just come in and wipe off some? Were they not coming out? Because a bit... It's plastic cheap from B and Q, and I cut it. I've cut it with a knife, a knife to get a nice smooth surface, but you can't. So when the bubbles come out, can you see all the little bubbles that are gathering round? Yeah. That's because of the liquid on the rough surface. I've tried as hard as I can to get smooth, but you can't. I need a glass tube. Saint Cobain, here we come. <laughs> So what are we what are we seeing here? What's the mechanism? What we're is bubbles being blown up the tube at the bottom, and every time a new bubble enters the tube, it pushes all the bubbles inside the tube up, up and out. So the bubbles are sort of like coming out, and they twist. Sometimes they go to the left, sometimes they go to the right. They just see right. Can you see the little diamond in the middle? Yeah. And they're self-ordering, and, and all the time whilst this is happening, the liquid is draining through them and dripping off the bottom. The bottom, yeah. Yeah. So you can see that when the liquid collects at the bottom, it's stretching them because the weight, mm -hmm. does that have anything to do with it? And then they ping back up again. See, look. And, ah. and, the, and the term bubble chain, is that something that you've coined or did that exist previously well, bubble chains exist usually yep. it's Guinness Book of World Records how many bubbles can you blow a single bubble on top of another one and how many you can get them yeah and created similar way with a sort of regulated same size bubble or is that something again you've kind of perfected yeah we've perfected it yeah this is my my big discovery for for bubble science no one knew they could do this See, beautiful. What is the longest bubble chain you've produced? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's not really the point. <laughs> I might use one of my special liquid solutions that I've made up because sometimes it can take months and months to get to a good working consistency. Uh, yeah, I might use one. Yeah, I, I think uh, <laughs> Michael's question, I, I would also presume that you had had a, a magical bubble ingredient, and I'm still not sure that you haven't, and you're just not letting on. Yeah, liquid glycerine. <laughs> but I went to the, the chemist to order, please can I have a tray of 24 bottles? Okay, video over. Of liquid glycerine, and they wouldn't let me buy it. Uh, why? But anyway, they wouldn't let me buy it because you use it for making bombs. They thought I was going to make bombs. I'm like, I'm photographing bubbles. So now I have a good, good relationship with a chemist and he's more than happy to let me buy lots of them. <laughs> anyway, okay, yes. so next one, next one. 
So this is what bubbles look like when they're first in the tube. Okay, the next photo, please. And again, that's after the liquid strains. You see they begin to crystallize, they're getting straight lines. And the next one, please. Uh, the same structure as the previous photo, but obviously with black background and you can see the light colors. And they're offset. Uh, yeah, the, the stairs, yeah. They, hmm. Yeah, they go like this. Okay, next photo. Yeah, that, that is my most perfect bubble chain photograph to date. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so maybe you can get a bit, bit of an idea of what we're talking about now. So at the top, you've got the creation of bubble chains where the equally bub sized bubbles go in the tube and then they come out the top. And Stefan's where the bubbles at the bottom you got little bubbles, they go up the tube and make you get those beautiful regular structures. Yeah. Okay, next one, please. That's the poster of the, dis the discovery that we uh, presented at Liege, EU Foam 2016. <laughs> Marvellous. The computer simulations Jens did then with Surface Evolver. And then you were talking about the new work. So when we were yeah. in Liege, uh, Dr. Florence Lias um, from Diderot in Paris University, she did a presentation where she was looking at soap films um, with sound waves, with music. So she has music, she puts a soap film. The soap film responds to the music and makes these amazing patterns. Is this part of a research or a, an actual application for this? No, this is, it, it's her research. But yeah. No, I just thought it was marvellous and I like music. So I came home and after lots of experimenting and and finding out about music and amps and goodness knows what I was be able to create these. So I just asked friends and family, pick a song and I'll, and I'll photograph it. The only problem is I have to listen to the song a lot, mm. an awful lot. And as the soap film vibrates in and out to the beat of the music, it goes in and out of focus. Mm -hmm. So, so what, what do we look at? Are these Petri dish? No, no, this, no. no? I'm keeping it quiet. It's <laughs> uh, can okay, you, can so, you tell us what music it was? Right, this is Frank Sinatra, My Way. Fabulous. So, but for every photo that looks okay, there's about 500 that I've deleted. Because <laughs> so uh, this is uh, Paula Pell Johnson's choice, the Nivoli Blanche, Ludovico Iannaldi. That was a good one. And then the next one, Back to Black, Amy Winehouse. Mm. So if you, if you look at them, the job from the art side of things um, and art symbolism, you might be able to relate Back to Black with that particular image, although it's a soap film. Mm -hmm. So when I'm doing my series, I'm, I've got the words, well, the lyrics printed out, I'm listening to the music and I go through all the the photos that are half okay to okay, to find one that matches the words of the song. Have you done an opera? <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Well, yeah. it was soap opera. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, great. Okay, and, and the best part of my, or one of the best part of my jobs is actually having an exhibition. So here for the very first time on the right hand wall, you can see lots of photos um, in little black and white frames and they're hung quite low. It's for children to see. Mm -hmm. So kids can come in and they can see them and they're dead cheap. You can buy them with pocket money. And the cabinet on the back wall is, um, I took some of the equipment that I used to create them. So, so yeah. So yeah. Can you do you want to talk about that very quickly? The the yeah. sort of te technical side of things, the technical capture. Okay, so exhibitions to have just the pictures on the walls, and I do. I have had those exhibitions, and I've loved doing them. But I think for this one, it was at Upton Country House in Paul. Um, lots of children, and you think need to talk to the children about it because you're combining art and science. 
and even the pictures on the back all the ones that we've seen in, in in this presentation a bit earlier it's very hard to get your head around what you're actually looking at mm. so you do, yeah, you're, just, you're doing this as a sort of outreach and educational exercise yeah. It's like, look, look, this is what you can see the fairy liquid there and you can see some of the other bits and pieces that I, and kids like that. They like to see. Hmm. Look at the gem, the picture that they've got no idea what it is. That's not going to get anywhere. Okay. So then, first front cover. Thank you, Bib. And the next one. Okay, so the light interference. This has been my most successful picture ever. And it has pretty much always been on the center page or page two and three, because you can't see the detail if it's printed quite small, so. No. Thank you very much, Lillian, um, at the New Scientist for contacting me about that one. And then another highlight was uh, Karen Uhlenbeck was the first uh, woman to win the Abel Prize for Maths. And the New York Times did a whole article on her, written by Siobhan Roberts. And they used my bubble photographs throughout the article. And then obviously that piece is syndicated by the news agencies around the world. So that was, yeah. Uh, a proud moment. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. And then I just can't believe I just added this photo when I'm sitting here and you can yeah. see it. <laughs> Didn't think that one through. Okay, and then the last photo. <laughs> okay, so fun. Fun. See if we went over. <laughs> <laughs> so, are we into Q and A's? Yeah, um, I mean, I've got a couple of questions that have come in, but if any one of our audience would like to put a question in the chat we, we'd love to to have them and, and answer those for you uh, we've got a few minutes to go um i just just wanted to pick up on a couple of things kim um you you ended or towards the end of your presentation you spoke about the the engagement with children and i, I just wondered if you talk a little bit more about how how you use your your own work to excite and and interest children um do you, well, you, do you I, I think with the exhibitions the the parents bring the kiddies in and because they're all bubbled you you've got immediate interest because the children can relate to them mm. if you hang them if you hang pictures at height that they can actually look at rather than adult height then they can just go and and children are switched on yeah and it's it, and are you approaching that from a, a science perspective or an art perspective or, or both That'll be a mother's perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, it, and I think also it's, it's quite nice if children can go into a gallery setting and, and feel comfortable. I think that's very important. It is, it's really important because then they'll grow up because children have pocket money and they have a bedroom wall. And they have four bedroom walls, hopefully. So I want to try and... and encourage children to not necessarily buy my book, but buy pictures, put them on the wall, look at something that you love that inspires you. Well, it's also um, engaging them with pretty pictures that ultimately engage with science um, in, in this case. And I think that's um, fabulous, uh, yeah. especially if there are questions then posed that they wouldn't have had the opportunity or even the thought to pose and open yeah. up their minds to uh, bigger and better things. Yeah, because bizarrely, I have given talks to kiddies and, and stuff, and when they find out that I'm a former fingerprint expert, they, they tend to want to know more about dead bodies and hands. <laughs> yes, as did I. <laughs> don't, don't mention that. Yeah, it's like, okay, because when I'm watching the regional bureau, obviously I was in Bristol and Avon and Somerset, Dorset, Gloucestershire, Wiltshire, uh, Devon and Cornwall, that you've got the coast and and you can't hoik a body up to the police headquarters in Bristol. 
So the coroner cuts the hands off, puts them in a bucket of four miles. Just too, oh, too far, bar. too far. Oh, yes. I think Michael's going to pull Love a plug back. I'm happy to go off for their dinner soon, actually, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> it was just amazing. Um, I've just got one final question that's come through. Um, okay. Just asking if you've got any hints and tips for anyone that might like to try and do their own bubble pictures i'm um, clearly not to the standard that you you've achieved over right. years. is it is it something that an amateur or someone just interested can do and get some yeah. interesting results you can easily do it but the first thing i say get a glass jar take the labels off put a little bit of water a bit of fairy liquid get a lid and um, and a straw and blow bubbles into the straw into the liquid and just look at them in the in the jar and if you blow gently you can get small bubbles see how many you can get and if you blow slowly you can get bigger bubbles but but just watch how they they all seem to fit in the jar and then i would say take photos with a mobile phone first <laughs> mm. I mean, mobile phone marvelous before you start getting equipment out it's easy to clean a mobile phone. Yeah. And in fact, there's a question that's just come through from Andrew, which actually picks up on this point. He's saying that I took some bubble pictures during lockdown and struggled with depth of field, even at F16. Uh, this is because the ca I couldn't get the camera perpendicular to the bubble. Any hints for Andrew? <laughs> Without going into lens and distance and lighting, and if you can't get the depth of field, blow a smaller bubble. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good good bit of advice. Uh, uh, yeah, I because I've, I've got my studio now, so I'm going to be having workshops and stuff. And we've just got a question or a comment uh, that, that's come in from Joe, who said that I thoroughly enjoyed the presentation. I shot a lot of bubbles for my A level in photography, all darkroom. So her choice and, and limited colours, but reflections and colours were so fascinating. As you said, they're moving all of the time. They are, and she did it with a cat in in a dark room. Yeah, whoa, brave lady. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've tried photographing um, with the Sinar P five film. Mm, useless, hopeless. Well, the camera wasn't useless. It was hopeless. Luckily, we have digital. Yeah, and yes. that's probably a good good point yeah. to just bring this evening to a close. I mean, it's been absolutely fascinating. And um, thank Kim, thank you for so much for sharing your, your passion, enthusiasm. I think you use the expression, a world of wonder. And it certainly opened up a world of wonder for me. And I knew your work, but I hadn't, I didn't know it to the level. And, and actually some of the science that lies behind it as well. And that for me was particularly interesting. And Hugh, thank you for your um, questions and the conversation with Kim, because I think that opened out some quite interesting avenues of, of that you explored together. So well, thank you both for your time this evening. Pleasure. Thank you to the audience as well for your, for staying with us this yes. evening it's been absolutely fascinating and that that world of wonder i think is is a, a really great fra phrase that sticks in my head and joe thanks to joe mcdonald the rps awards manager for organizing this evening it's been yeah. absolutely fascinating thank you, joe. yeah so thank you. Thank, thank you everyone and thank you Michael. Can I say a very 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 big thank you for the award Oh, well, it's a pleasure, and it's well deserved, and and the and also the award you 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 got through the the science photographer as well. That was well deserved, and um, I'm sure we're going to keep seeing your work in in different places. So, you know, it's a pleasure, and so thank you both, you you and Kim, for everything. Yes. Okay. So now let's get some bubbles. Yes, I think I'm yeah, going to do my washing up now. I'm going to yeah. start to have a look at those bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks, well, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thanks to the good audience. night. Thank and you for thank attending. Kim, jo Bye. Jo and thank Hugh. you. Good night.